Today I want to introduce the philosophy of Descartes. Descartes, I believe, is one of the most powerful and insightful figures in our philosophical tradition, and his ideas have been hugely influential in shaping our contemporary world. So I'm going to focus on his meditations on first philosophy, though the ideas presented in that work uh, are also uh, found in other works, like the Discourse on Method and the Principles of Philosophy. Uh, but I'm going to focus especially on the second meditation and on two arguments uh, he makes there, uh, often referred to as the cogito argument and the wax argument. And I'm going to try to bring out what I think is the real uh, import, the real, uh, the real significance of those arguments. And I'll also contextualize that by reference to a few other parts of his work. So I'd like you to start by reflecting on the nature of your everyday experience. Right? Normally, we just find ourselves in the world noticing stuff. There's a chair, there, there are books, right? And without even thinking about it, we unquestioningly take ourselves to have direct and immediate access to the real, right? And, and what is most obvious, right? These things, these books, uh, this, uh, this chair, and so on. Right? As, as Descartes says uh, in the second meditation, uh, I'm using this Hackett edition, and in that edition it's on page 67. He refers to uh, those things which are commonly believed to be the most distinctly grasped of all, namely the bodies we touch and see. Yeah, there's a book here, right? Uh, and again, he, he uh, referred to that same thing back in the first meditation. Uh, he said, um, there are, this is uh, page 60 of this volume, he says, uh, there are many matters concerning which it seems one simply cannot doubt. Uh, for example, that I'm sitting here next to the fire, wearing my winter dressing gown, that I'm holding this sheet of paper in my hands, and the like, right? That's, that is the form our everyday experience takes, kind of immediate and unquestioned presumption of the obviousness and the reality of those things around us, those, those bodies. Right? But he wants to challenge that everyday presumption we have that our immediate perception is directly giving us the true nature of reality. And he does that by uh, focusing on an aspect of, of that description you've already given. Right? So let me read that from the second meditation again, uh, page 67. He, he said, remember, he's going to refer to those things which are commonly believed to be most distinctly grasped of all, namely the bodies we touch and see. So, so basically, Descartes says about this everyday uh, uh, view we have, uh, with what justification do we have that view? And so when we say that these are the bodies that we touch and see, really what that means is, well, how we have come to know the world is, you know, through touching and seeing right? and things like that. So that's what he said back in the, again, in the first meditation on page 60, giving voice to uh, what should be, a, you know, everybody's normal view. Uh, surely whatever I have admitted until now as most true I received either from the senses or through the senses. Right? So we live normally with two pretty familiar views that we take to be obviously true. These things around me are just there and I, you know, I'm apprehending the true nature of things. And, and how do you apprehend the true nature of things? Well, through my senses. Uh, those two claims both seem pretty straightforward. But there's actually a little bit of a tension between them because uh, in noticing that we touch and see them, we are recognizing that that awareness we have of things in the world must somehow have come into being. The world as we have it is in a way a product of our activities of sensing. So the, the sort of implicit tension between those two views is that the one view takes these things as just immediately and directly there without question. But that second point, that we know them through the senses, actually sort of implies that, well, they're not so immediate and direct. 
there, there's something we have to go through to get them. And we can then raise the question, well, you know, are our senses reliable? How, can our senses let us know the true nature of things? Um, uh, so that's that's the the first move that Descartes makes in in a three or four step process of really trying to get you to turn your attention away from the things noticed to you know, your act of noticing, your act of apprehending. What what he really wants to do through the first meditation and, and up to his uh, cogito argument in the second meditation is get you really to turn your attention to the fact that you are experiencing and to notice the distinctive nature of experience. And in that recognition of the role of sensing is the first step there, right? It, it's, it's noticing that uh, the, the world as we see it uh, is the, the end result, you might say, of some kind of process that's going on in our experiencing. Um, and now he wants to look a little further at those uh, experiential processes that are what allow us to have an experience of the world. You know, he says uh, about uh, our perception of, of things, where he, where he says, I'm sitting here by the fire in my winter dressing gown and so on. Um, he says, you know, we, we relate to those things saying, well, they're indubitable, right? But then, as he says again uh, on, uh, on the page 60, he says, uh, this would all be well and good were I not a man who is accustomed to sleeping at night, experiencing my dreams, the very same things. You know, how often does my evening slumber persuade me uh, of such ordinary things as these, that I am here clothed in my dressing gown seated next to the fireplace, when in fact I'm lying undressed in bed. Right? So the dreams, again, are, are a pretty striking thing because there we find ourselves uh, gripped by what seems to be a very real experience. And yet, you know, upon reflection, upon consideration, we say, you know, that was not real. One thing was really happening. I was lying in bed sleeping, but I took myself to be doing something else. So that point, you know, further brings out this notion that the simple fact that we're gripped by the compelling sense that something is the case doesn't make it so, right? And that's not a claim he's inventing. He's saying we already have that view because we already distinguish dreams from reality. And we know, even though dreams seem real, we don't believe that to be the case. Uh, he uses that then to make a further point, which draws us more deeply into what the processes are, uh, what the experiential processes are that give rise to our experience of the world. Right? And he says, so he says, like, if I'm dreaming, yeah, maybe I could be wrong about this or that. Like, maybe it's not me in a winter dressing gown. But he says, uh, even though these things seen in dreams, eyes, hands, heads, and the like, even though they could be imaginary, maybe I'm dreaming up all that stuff. Don't we have to admit that at least certain other things that are more simple and universal are true, uh, as such that it's from these components that those images are made? And so what, what would that be? Well, this class of things would include corporeal nature in general, together with its extension, the shape of extended things, their quantity, that is, their size and number, as well as the place where they exist, the time through which they endure, and the like. So, yes, it's true that when we dream, uh, we imagine ourselves in a world uh, that is not, in fact, the world we're really in. Uh, but, he, but his point there is, even if those actual bodies we imagine aren't real, isn't it still the case that what it is to be a body is still true, right? And so, so yes, we may very well doubt the particular way we imagine something, but that's different from the recognition of the truths of physical nature, right? the basic laws of bodies and space and motion and so on and and beyond that he says you know e even if those things weren't true aren't the basic rules of mathematics and quantity going to be true right whether i'm awake or asleep two plus three make five a square doesn't have more than four sides and so on so what he's showing through that point about dreams and about 
laws of physics and quantity and so on, is that in our experiencing, in the dreams, or in our everyday experience of sitting by the fire in the winter dressing gown, something is going on in that experience that we typically don't notice. So typically, we just take ourselves to uh, be engaged in the world. We don't actually notice that whatever we take to be happening must be something we're getting through our senses. We can recognize it when our attention is drawn to it, but we don't typically find ourselves like seeing red dot here and there and so on and uh, uh, from recognizing our activity of sensing construct a theory about what the things are in the world. No, we just directly are wrapped up in things. But he's drawn our attention to the fact that in fact whatever we're experiencing is something is, is an experience we're having through sensing. Right? Well, he's doing something similar here. He's saying you take yourself to be recognizing a body. Yeah, like there's a chair, there's a, um, a book, whatever. Yeah, that, that seems straightforward. What you're not typically noticing, but what is in fact happening, is that in that recognition, you're always actually drawing on your understanding of the nature of bodies and your grasp of relations of quantity and so on. So just as there are activities of sensing that provide the only context in which any of this experiencing happens. Similarly, there are these activities of understanding, of grasping the nature of bodies and the nature of number that are integral aspects of any everyday recognition of things, but we don't typically notice that. Right? So what has he done then in that first meditation by going through, you know, what in the meditation is, is um, presented as a, a matter of doubting, like, okay, how can you be certain it's right? Well, could you doubt it on these grounds? Could you doubt it on these grounds? What he's doing and going through that process is getting you actually to notice the, uh, what we could call the subjective processes or the experiential processes that uh, provide the context within which you have your everyday experience of things. Uh, and so now, going to the cogito argument, uh, the cogito argument, it seems to me, is really just the completion of that point that I've just articulated. So basically, what he's done in the first meditation is said, you know, a, a, something that's familiar to surely anyone living in the 21st century now, you know, the, this idea like, couldn't this all be an illusion? Um, uh, couldn't, couldn't I be tricked and... Um, reality isn't really the way I take it to be, like maybe there's some strange computer running my experience or something like that, right? We've heard those ideas many times and it seems to me that's a familiar kind of thought. Uh, and so he's, in the first meditation, he's tried to give reasons for why it, it seems right that you can doubt everything. And so in the second meditation, he then says, well, is it true? Is it true that I can doubt everything? And his answer is no. You can't doubt everything because uh, if you were to try to doubt the fact of your own experience, your effort to doubt that would contradict it. Right? In the very attempt to doubt it, you would have to experience yourself doubting. Right? So the the cogito argument is, uh, you know, f famously that you know, uh, you f you find yourself there thinking every time you try to doubt yourself. So he says in the second meditation, uh, I have persuaded myself that there's nothing in the world, right? No sky, no earth, no minds, no bodies. Uh, but is it the case that I too do not exist? Wait, but doubtless I did exist if I persuaded myself of something. Oh, but, but maybe there's some deceiver who's so powerful that he's deliberately deceiving me. Well, but then there too, there is no doubt that I exist if he is deceiving me. Let him do his best at deception. He will never bring it about that I am nothing, so long as I shall think that I am something. Thus, after everything has been most carefully weighed, I must, it must finally be established that this pronouncement, I am, I exist, is necessarily true every time I utter it or conceive it in my mind. Right? So that's the so-called cogito argument, the I think argument. Right? So 
What is the point of that? Well, the, the point is just the, the real conclusion of what those earlier remarks about sensing and understanding and so on were drawing your attention to. Right? What he's trying to do is take you away from your first automatic presumption that there's just this world and you're in it to getting you to notice yourself as an experiencing being. And that's that recognition of yourself as the one who is experiencing this. That is the conclusion of the Kogito argument. So he's going through, by his process of doubt, he's going through trying to get you to notice that what you have formerly taken to be just the direct presence of the world is actually an experience that you are having, you who are a subject. And that then raises the question, how can it be the case that for a subject, there is an objective world? And the Kogito argument is really trying to get you in the position where you can see that question and see the need to answer it. The thing that needs to be explained is how it can be the case that for subjects there can be, as there manifestly is, an experience of a real world. So what has the Kogito argument shown? Well, it's shown that behind your normal presumption that that world right there is the most obvious and direct thing that's sort of presenting itself to you, there is always the implicit reality that you are experiencing. Right? It's only on condition that you are there experiencing that the experience of the obvious world can happen. So the cogito argument is you know, you making explicit to yourself that awareness of your own subjectivity that was always the very fabric of your experience, but that you were sort of overlooking in favor of your, you know, assumption of the primacy of the world, that, the, that those things out there are, are, you know, there first, you know. And so you can say a little bit more about what that means too, right? When you ask now, what am I? We use that word I all the time. Well, what the Kogito argument has shown is that what you really are is an act of experiencing. Normally, that's not what you would say. You say, what are you? You'd say, oh, I'm this guy, you know, sitting here in the chair, this guy, in, or in Descartes' case, the guy sitting in his winter dressing gown by the fire, this body. Uh, we normally without thinking, take ourselves to be one of the things in the world, one of the naturally occurring bodies. But the Kogito argument shows that that's, that's not really right. What you really are is an act of experiencing. And, you know, whereas you as a natural body would be, like any other body, something to be understood and explained by the way bodies work, by the laws of nature, you as an act of experiencing have to be understood differently, have to be understood by the laws and rules of subjectivity. So Descartes' argument then is really shifting the analysis of our experience away from the sense that it's something to be causally explained by the interaction of bodies to the idea that experience itself needs to be explained on its own terms, that we need to move into the domain of the unique rules, let's say, of being a subject, the laws of subjectivity. And so he continues with that now in the wax argument. So he says, let us now consider those things which are commonly believed to be most distinctly grasped of all, namely the bodies we touch and see, right? Let's turn to what we formerly thought was the most basic and obvious thing now that we've seen that things aren't quite the way we understood, let's ask 
Well, then how do we know them? How is it the case that we're able to have that experience? And so then he takes, uh, takes a little experiment, right? He says, let's take, for example, this piece of wax. Right? It has been taken quite recently from the honeycomb. It has not yet lost all its honey flavor. It retains some of the scent of the flowers from which it was collected. Its color, shape, and size are manifest. It is hard and cold. It is easy to touch. If you rap on it with your knuckle, it will emit a sound. In short, everything is present in it that appears needed to enable a body to be known as distinctly as possible. But notice that as I am speaking, I'm bringing it close to the fire. The remaining traces of the honey flavor are disappearing. The scent is vanishing. The color is changing. The original shape is disappearing. Its size is increasing. It is becoming liquid and hot. You can hardly touch it. And now when you wrap on it, it no longer emits a sound, right? So what he's done is he's taken this thing and turned to his senses, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, and said with, with each one of those senses, you know, what do I get when I relate to this piece of wax? And then he melts it and asks the same question. Now what do I get when I turn to it with each of those senses? Well, every issue has changed. It's changed its visible character. It's changed its olfactory character. It's changed its tangible character, etc. With respect to each sense, what you're getting has basically gone from the opposite. Cold to hot, makes a sound, doesn't make a sound, has a smell, doesn't have a smell, and so on. So now remember, again, going back to uh, you know the first meditation, he said, you know, what, what we think, you know, surely whatever I have admitted until now is most true, I received either from the senses or through the senses, right? And what we think we grasp most distinctly are the bodies we touch and see. Right? And so normally what we think is, or what, what, you know, what we believe is, uh, oh, I know that by my senses. And that's what he wants to test here. Can that be true? And his conclusion is going to be no. Right? So the specific question he asks is, he's melted the wax, does the same wax still remain? Yes, you would say, that piece of wax melted. It was solid, now it is liquid. Right? So I must confess that it does. No one would deny it, no one would think otherwise. Right? So how do you grasp that it? How is it that you know the piece of wax? That's the thing you couldn't know through your senses because if you were to turn uniquely and distinctly to your senses to say what's going on there, they would say a completely different thing is there now. With respect to every sensory issue, it's gone from, you know, X to not X. So from the point of view of the senses, you are now encountering an entirely different reality. It's an entirely opposed sensory reality to the sensory reality it was before. And yet, despite that complete opposition at the level of what is sensorily present, we recognize the same thing to be there. Right? What was there didn't change, only its way of appearing changed. So the question then is, how do we know that? You can't, you can't perceive it by sensing. And what more exactly is it that you're sensing? Well, he said, what, uh, the real issue, the thing that's there is a body that a short time ago manifested itself to me in these ways and now does so in other ways. We're talking about what it is to recognize a body, right? a, a single existing body bodily thing. And, and what is the character of that bodily thing? Well, he says, let, let's take away everything that doesn't belong to it in that sense of being self-same. Well, then you're going to take away all those changing sensory qualities, right? Those are the way it uh, manifested itself to you. But, but its core identity can't be either one or the other, right? Uh, it, it, uh, since it's, it, sometimes it's this one and sometimes it's the opposite, right? So he says, we'll remove everything that doesn't distinctly belong to its being as this piece of wax as such. And he says, therefore, what would that thing be? Well, it's something, you know, extended, flexible, and mutable. Right? He's trying to find some terms to characterize just the essential features of being a body. Right? And he says, 
you know, the wax has changed. And furthermore, in grasping it as a body, what I'm really grasping is that the wax is capable of innumerable changes of this sort, even though I am incapable of running through these innumerable changes by using my imagination, right? In other words, when you recognize something as a body, you know it could change in all kinds of ways. And it's not because you thought, oh, it could change this way. And you've also thought, oh, it could change this other way and this other one. No, you didn't imagine some long, finite list of possible changes. Rather, you grasp that the very meaning of what it is to be a body is, is that it can change, as he says, in innumerable ways, in ways you haven't thought of and couldn't think of. And there would always be other ways it could change while still staying the same. Like, you know, it could get one degree warmer. It could get three sixteenths of a degree warmer, whatever. Like there's no limit to the infinitely varied ways it could change while still being the same thing. The relevant word there is infinite. Right? You have grasped something in recognizing it as a body. Right? What, what is entailed in recognizing something as a body is that you are recognizing something as an it, a thing that remains self-same through changing manifestations, and that the manifestations it could change through are, are infinite. That's what it means to grasp that core. Well, uh, that recognition of a self-sameness capable of infinite variation is, in principle, not the kind of thing that can be sensed. It's something you understand, right? And so that's why he says, I perceive it through the mind alone. So he says, but so, so what is this piece of wax which is perceived only by the mind? Like, am I talking about some weird magical thing? No. Sure, I'm talking about the same piece of wax that I see, touch, and imagine. In short, I'm talking about the same piece of wax I took it to be from the very beginning. What I'm realizing is that the perception of wax is neither a seeing, nor a touching, nor an imagining, nor has it ever been, even though it previously seemed so. Rather, it is an inspection on the part of the mind alone. So... What he's done is he's making the point here explicitly that I sort of implied earlier. I was saying before, you know, we have an immediate sense, oh, the world is right there, and we take it to be sort of obvious. But in fact, there are subjective processes that go into our being able to have such an experience. And whereas we take ourselves just directly and immediately to be somehow seeing those things, what he's trying to show here is if you look at the very character of what it is that you recognize, you will see that those things you recognize are incapable of being recognized on the basis of your senses. That the, the way you recognize a thing has built into it understanding. So he drew our attention back in the first meditation to the idea that our senses play a role, but also you remember he referred to our understanding of, you know, the, the principles of bodies and the principles of mathematics. Well, that's the point he's bringing back here now, right? That uh, intrinsic to any experience you have of a body is the active role of your mind in recognizing things as uh, infinitely variable, self-same it's, right? The, the, it's, it is only insofar as you, on the basis of your ability to understand things, grasp that that's what you're encountering, that the sensory changes you encounter can be let's say, interpreted by you, or I guess the right way to say is understood by you as the way a body is changing. So that then is the central point of the wax argument. Now, that notion that we've just been talking about, the notion of the body as an it that stays self-same through the you know changing ways, the 
contradictory ways, you know, hot and cold, that it manifests itself and that could take infinitely varied forms. That, that is the notion, that, that notion of that kind of it, that's the notion of what we would call a substance, that a, which just means an independently existing reality. And so the point then that Descartes is making is that we are the kinds of beings who understand what substances are. We don't just encounter you know, changing sensory displays. We encounter those changing sensory displays as the way some thing is appearing differently. Right, That thinghood of the thing is not itself sensible. It's what's most real about the thing. It's what it is. But we don't see it. We grasp it. We understand it. Uh, as I said, that that's the kind of being we are. We are capable of doing that. Right? And, you know, I imagine a chicken or a worm doesn't grasp substances. You know, they respond on the basis of instinct to changing stimuli or whatever in their environment. But I don't think it occurs to them that, oh, that is an it. But that does occur to us, right? And that is the characteristic of being, as Descartes says, a thinking thing, right? That's what it means to say that, as he says, we, we grasp it by the inspection of the mind. That's what it means to say that you are mind. You are that unique kind of being, that unique kind of subject who has built into your reality the ability to recognize substances, realities. Uh, and so, you know, let's think about that idea again, the idea of substance, right? It's not like something sensory that has come into you from the outside. It's, it's intrinsic to your experience that you can recognize that. Okay. We've just shown you didn't learn it, you used it. But, you know, even though it's in that sense internal to you, you also didn't make it up, right? It's not like something you just imagined, right? It's, it's something that f forces you to see things in a certain way, right? It's, it's in the nature of your subjectivity that you are compelled to understand the world in terms of that notion of substance right and so that's in the third meditation then Descartes distinguishes between those things that come into us from outside like sensation those ideas we formulate for ourselves in imagination and those kinds of ideas that are intrinsic to the kind of experiencing being we are that are innate to us that, that are definitive of what it is to be a mind. Right? And so that, and that's one of them, right? That's one of those ideas. But then he goes on with about that a bit further. And this is the last point that I want to make. Uh, um, the very idea of a substance, an idea that you operate with whenever you see a body, or indeed, whenever you say about yourself, I'm an it through all my changing psychological states. First, I'm happy, then I'm unhappy, but it's the same me. Right? When you recognize yourself as a thinking thing, or when you recognize that as a body, in either case, you're drawing on your intrinsic capability as a mind to recognize realities, to recognize substances, to operate with that term, you know, reality. Uh, but that notion of an independently existing thing has a little bit more critical force than we've noticed so far. Because if you think about uh, any body that you would normally think of as an independently existing thing, well, it's not totally independent, right? The wax or the dog or whatever, those bodies exist in the larger network of bodies that are causally connected to each other, right? So, uh, you know, the dog isn't wholly responsible for its own condition. On the contrary, if someone comes along and hits it with a stick, it'll have a big scar on it, you know, or it'll bleed, right? And that its, its condition will have been 
the result of its interaction with another body, right? So its condition is not just something it brings about on itself. Rather, it's part of a larger system. So if we really say, what is an independently existing reality, or, or rather, what is the independently existing reality, we have to recognize there is only one. There is the independently existing reality, which we call reality. And if we make that recognition, then we have to say, well, those things that we normally take to be independent things, individual bodies, are themselves really only the changing ways in which reality as such shows itself. And so that has a consequence, again, for that initial thing we started with, our immediate sense that we just directly encounter the real. Right? Through his Kogito argument, Descartes made us notice, oh, uh, that's an act of experiencing that uh, depends on certain sorts of subjective processes and so on. But now, by, by noticing what one of those was, namely the, the fact of understanding the world we sense in light of our innate grasp of what it is to be a substance or what it is for something to be real, that has a further implication for that thing we started out with, thinking, oh, these are just uh, the real things around us. Right? We have to recognize that, no, the world as we encounter it in perception is not the simple way that the real is. On the contrary, what we encounter is the way reality is appearing. But the real as such will be the causal source of all those things. And so Descartes' reflection is really taking us to the point where we see that to actually truly apprehend what's going on out there, we will have to understand that world of bodies that we encounter in our everyday perceptual life in light of the workings of reality, which basically means the laws of nature that cause them, right? The laws of reality of which their current form is the effect. So Descartes' argument here, his cogito argument, his wax argument, and then his subsequent development of that notion of substance in the third meditation, in, in what is what he presents as an argument for the existence of God, uh, is uh, an argument really for the existence of nature. I mean, that's what he really means by God here, I think. He means um, substance as such, the independently existing real that is the source of everything. And this is really an argument for saying we don't really understand those things outside us if we just take them in their immediately given form. We have to go further to grasp what the laws of reality or the laws of nature are that are being shown to us through these effects. And so in that way, it seems to me, Descartes' text is really a kind of founding document for the scientific revolution uh, of the uh, 16th, 17th, and 18th century that has given rise to so much of the modern world that, that we live in. Mm -hmm.